in the what Benedict the Sixteenth calls the mythology, the Christian mythology of creation. In the book of Genesis, we see God alone, and then we see God creating what now exists. And before we move on, I want to mention that that idea of Christian mythos is an important understanding for us to look at the book of Genesis, or specifically the first two chapters, three chapters of Genesis correctly, that Greek mythology is, uh, is, is a very different thing from what we're talking about when we talk about a Christian mythology. Um, and this is why Benedict takes the time to explain it and, and to actually use the word. He doesn't, he doesn't shy away from it, but in fact, he uses it and explains it, which is what I'm going to try to do here, that in Greek myth, there was uh, a, a, a dis, discontextualization. It, it takes the story out of reality because it doesn't really exist creates a story that then has a moral, and that's really all the myth is, is an attempt to uh, explain um, some universal truth. And that's good. That's, that's, a, that's a fine thing, right? Um, but then building sort of a, a pantheon of, of, of gods and trying to impose that, that mythology onto creation is where sort of paganism comes in. That's where, that's where we start to perceive the world in a way that it's not perceive things the way that they're not. The Christian mythology sort of works in the opposite in the opposite direction, where we receive from God the reality, and we try to understand reality within the context of history and, and, and reality, and to tell a story that allows us to understand how God did what he did, that does not make it untrue, but uses literary devices to describe what we can't experience and, and weren't around to experience, right? So the book of Genesis paints us a picture, not of exact, the exact unfolding of events as they exactly did, as like a scientific textbook may try to do. But instead, it tries to answer a deeper question through the images, not of how did God make creation, that's a question for science, but rather why? did God make creation? And the book of Genesis uses the material of the question, how did God make all things, in order to answer the question, why did God make all things? And that that, that subtlety of, of understanding the question is really important in understanding the answer. If somebody comes up and says, no, that's not really the way God made the world, you don't have to get all in a tizzy and feel like your whole faith is, is under attack. If, you know, like, and this is what happens with the fundamental Protestants, right? God, or I mean, the devil buried the dinosaurs to confuse man because everybody knows the world's only 5,000 years old, right? That's, that's not, that's not what, we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about the book of Genesis, right? This is not a scientific explanation of the way God made the world. Instead, it is, a, it is, is more of a, a, a fatherly description of how much he loves you, right? It's what the creation account really is. Let me tell you a story of how much I love you. Before you existed, I brought you into existence because I love you, right? And, and so moving forward from that understanding and way of understanding the book of Genesis, we can see that it's not so much a matter of, of okay, God, let's see, the water's above and the water's below, so there's no water above, it's just empty space, so Christianity must be, Judaism and Christianity must be wrong, right? That's not what the book of Genesis is about. It's not about articulating the scientific fact of, 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 this, of the, the heavens. It's, it's, about, it's about saying God loves you so much that in the beginning, when the earth was formless, and darkness covered the abyss, and there was the chaos of water and the wind, God said, let there be light, so that in the end, when he made you, you would have light. He made earth, so that when he made you, you'd have some place to put your feet. He made water, so that when he made you, you'd have something to, to be cooled by and to, to drink, to, to satiate, your, satiate your thirst, right? He made the, the plants and the animals, right? So this is the, this is the purpose of, of the account of Genesis. 
Now, having said that, let's look at the, the sort of the process here because this is really important. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was for a formless wasteland and darkness covered the abyss. Now, uh, I, I said this recently, I think maybe at Women's Night of Reflection, how, how do you describe nothingness? You have to use positive imagery to describe nothing because you can't describe nothing, right? So the idea of, of saying, okay, well, God created something out of nothing, somebody might say, well, no, 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 there was already the world there. It was just an abyss. Well, no, that's not, that's not what's being said here. What's being said, what's being used here is, is language to try to articulate nothingness. Did you guys ever see the never-ending story? Yeah? The nothing that's creeping across the universe, right? How do you describe that? You really can't, right? And they struggled with that, that idea in that, in that really weird psychedelic movie, right? So this is, kind of, this is kind of the author of the book of Genesis to struggle with the idea of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth when the God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and it was wasteland. Darkness covered the abyss. Right? So we have this idea of absence. God is a positive presence. Without What is not God, then, is a negative absence. It's a, it's a vacuum. It's a nothingness. Also, God is knowledge, he's wisdom, he is order, he is uh, direction, he is, is positive force. And so we also get the opposite of that, that mighty winds swept over the waters. And when we, when we hear that, we hear the roar of the wind and we see the tumult of these, these, these reckless waves, sort of, there's this sort of dark, formless earth and this recklessness of these waves. And the Jews always understood the waters and the sea to be a symbol of chaos, of disorder, of, of something to be feared, a, a, th a symbol of death, right? Darkness. And so we're getting the stage set here for without God, there is nothing, and there is no purpose, there is no reason. But when God comes into the, pre into the stage, when he, when he manifests himself, two things come out of that, substance and light. And that happens when God says, let there be light. First activity that God does into the void, into the nothingness, into the chaos, is to bring something into it and make it well-ordered. There is a reason for it. We can imagine this happening as scientists imagine it happening, that God, God brings into existence this, this core stuff and then boom explodes it right not in a reckless nonsensical explosion but an explosion that is so well ordered by the laws of physics which he imposed on the substance of matter before it existed you guys following me okay no no or yes okay good because we're going all over the place. There is a reason for this, I promise. So, we, if, we, if we think about the Big Bang and the idea of it, people, atheists may say, well, atheists have two problems, right? Well, atheists have probably whole life problems, right? <laughs> but in this particular situation, one, where did the stuff come from? You can't, you can't assume the, the, the principle, right? You can't assume the very thing that you're trying to define. You can't assume that you're going to explain where everything came from by assuming that stuff was already there, right? So obviously we have God then bringing that substance into existence. But then atheists also would say, okay, well, let's, let's say we're not going to argue about where the stuff came from. The stuff was in a so apparently all the universe was in a tight little golf ball, and then something affected it, and boom, it exploded. But they'd say it exploded into utter chaos. But it didn't explode into utter chaos. It exploded into an environment that had rules. Where did those rules come from? 
Where did those laws that we call the laws of physics come from? They came from the illumination of God. Let there be light. This is God speaking order, rule, direction into the, into the cosmos. When he says, let there be light here, don't imagine the sun. Remember, he didn't create the sun for many days, right? He says, after he creates the dome, he says, let's put a ball up here for day, and we can put a ball up here over here for night. That's the creation of the sun and the moon. And now, whether or not that happened that way or not, it doesn't matter. The point is the author of Genesis is saying that, that the light that God spoke in the beginning is not, don't get that confused with the sun, the light that God spoke into the world is not, is, not, is not visible illumination, it's reason, it's purpose, it's order. This is the first thing God speaks into the universe, because without that, all the stuff he makes would just slip right back into chaos, wouldn't it? And so he creates... He creates the landscape, he creates the boundaries, he creates the structure of his whole creation. Now, throughout the the, the rest of this this long bit here, we get an, an elevation of creation. Every time he makes something new, he makes the higher, greater, more noble structure, right? Um... Let there be light, let's see. Then he, he makes a dome, atmosphere, whatever. Then lights, okay, so sun and moon, okay, fine. Then vegetation, then, um, then uh, let's see, do, 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 do. And creepy crawly things, right? And ultimately he's going to end with, with humanity. The, the, the progression of creation is more and more complex and more and more noble as it goes, as it goes along. Ending with us. But each one of those creations, each one of those manifestations of higher and more noble creatures, they have to, they have to exist within that framework that God initially creates. Now this is where, this is where we start our homily. <laughs> having, having set the stage, we can begin. The purpose of the book of Genesis is to tell you how much God loves you and why. And he does, the the author of the book of Genesis does that by telling you how God created the heavens and the earth. But the way that God created the heavens and the earth is exactly the same way he created you. In the beginning, when you weren't, he made you. And he knew you. And in knowing you, you were given reason purpose, meaning, value. And as you progressed through your life, you matured. And what was once turbulent and exciting and, and virile and, and formless in your, in your adolescence began to take on structure and meaning in relationships and in works of mercy and in charity through life. And the, the value and the meaning of that was, was infused with grace, a grace apart from which we could not exist any more than the things that God made could exist apart from the stage that he set in his word, in his reason, in his logos. That our whole life as Christians, beginning with the seminal word coming into us, speaking into us, God seeing us formless and void and without meaning, having been born into sin, redeems us from that chaos by speaking a word into us at baptism, light. You have life now. That initial outpouring of grace into our heart It's the same thing that happens when God says, let there be light. From the chaos, he brings order. But that order has to be persistent in the structure of creation the whole way through. Our life has to be consistent in the life of grace that God gives us the whole way through. This is why we have sacraments that follow us the entire course of our lives. The initial 
meaning of our life, the initial life of our life being given to us in baptism, followed up by confirmation and the Eucharist, marriage, holy orders, and then as we continue to mature and we, we continue to need the restructuring, the, re, re, uh, the, re, um, uh, su- the, the support of, our, of, of those foundational graces, we get the sacrament of confession, and then in the end, to follow us through to the very end, to be returned to God, we get the, the, the gift of the anointing of the sick to fortify us from fear of returning to that chaos, the darkness where there is no light, death. God gives us that final grace so that we don't have to be afraid of that because that's not where we're returning. But rather we're carrying on forward farther into his heart into heaven. The book of Genesis, then the way he structures us, the way way he's speaking and articulating himself to us is directly translatable to our lives. Our lives change. They develop and they grow more noble. It's very possible that just as in the structure of the book of Genesis, the greatest, most noble creation that God brings about in your life happens in the later years. When in the book of Genesis he would create humanity. After all of the the less noble years have gone by after all the less noble creations have gone by, after perhaps the, the, the tumult and the chaos that is indicative of rearing children, after the, the messiness of learning to live with another person that is marriage, after the insanity that is puberty, after the, after the, 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 the brain damagedness that is adolescence, right? Um, and, and even before that, the, 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 the freedomlessness that is being a toddler, Right? But every one of those stages has to be marked by God's grace, or it slips back into the non existence and chaos from which it came. But the thing is, that grace is available at every stage of your life. That no matter what chaos, is trying to get back into the the order and the light of God's creation, his good creation that you are. No matter the tumult, no matter the, 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 the struggle, no matter that impression of the nothingness trying to creep across the universe that we saw in, in the, the never-ending story, God continues to speak the one word he's only ever spoken. He's only spoken it once, but has never stopped speaking it. And he speaks it into your life. He's spoken it once in baptism, but hasn't stopped speaking it since that moment. Grace. Word. Light. Ultimately, the one word that God speaks into ex- all things into existence, and the only one word that he speaks into our lives is Christ. He's always there because the Father has never stopped speaking him into your life. And so no matter what chaos you recall, no matter what chaos you're in, no matter what chaos you're afraid of entering into, know that God is always there speaking that word into your life. A word that you will presently receive in flesh as a testament of his love for you in the Eucharist.